So let's get started with pruning unruly apple trees. So first question I always get is, why do we even prune fruit trees? Why can't we just let them go? Why is it such a big deal? So um, there's four main reasons. There's, there's quite a few other ones, but the real ones are, um, first, especially for us with homes, homeowners, we're trying to mow our yards. We might have cars if they're near our parking spots, near our driveways, near other places where we go. Uh, basically, we prune them to prevent damage to a tree by equipment or from something else. So every time there's damage to a tree and uh, the bark gets broken or a branch gets broken, it's an entry point for insects or for diseases to come in. So we prune to make sure that one, we're not causing any obstacles um, in our path, and then two, the tree doesn't get hurt by it. Um, farmers typically, we uh, refer to this as tractor blight. So whenever we're out in the orchards, uh, commercially too, it's always a, a big concern to make sure that tractors and equipment aren't hitting trees, causing tractor blight. Uh, the next part is it opens up the canopy. So whenever we're uh, growing fruit, uh, whether it be commercially or for our own use, um, having an open canopy allows for air to come in. Um, and the more air movement, the quicker those leaves and branches and fruit dry out. And that's really important because there's a lot of fungi and bacteria that also want to eat your apples or any other fruit that you grow. And the less water um, that's available for them, the better. So they need a lot of water or a lot of water film and moisture to grow. So that's the, one of them. Um, the second one for opening the canopy is apples need sunlight to turn red and ripen. So if there's a lot of shade going on, um, you're not going to get nice red fully developed fruit. And last but not least, um, the wood needs to have some direct contact with the light because that's how new apple buds develop. If it's completely shaded out, you won't get any new apple buds forming. Uh, next, we want to make sure we remove any bad wood. So that might be damaged wood from previous uh, summer experiences of the tree, but it could also be some disease got in there. Maybe it's just getting old and brittle. Apple wood can be kind of brittle, especially as the trees get older. Uh, this lets us keep the trees healthy by removing anything diseased, damaged, or dead. And really, it just keeps the trees healthy. You know, we don't want the uh, branches to break or fall in our yards. And the cleaner the cuts, the better it is for the tree, less fungi, less decay, and things like that get in there. Okay. Then the next question I always get is, well, why would I, why am I pruning my apples in February? It's super cold. Why can't I just do it in the summer? Um, and there's a couple of reasons for this. Uh, the first and the biggest one is less chance of pest infections. So right now at this time, uh, we don't have a lot of um, insects flying around. We also don't have a lot of fungal spores or um, pathogens in the air. So a lot of the fungi that get into trees that can cause them to go hollow or cause uh, wounds um, are airborne spores. Some people have allergies to them even, um, and they're not really out this time of year. Um, the wood also heals better. It's kind of slower. It's not putting all of its energy into leaves um, or making fruit. So it can heal those wood wounds pretty nice. And by the time the flowers come out, those wounds are typically healed. Uh, the next is less chance of oozing wounds. And when I say oozing wounds, I'm, I'm looking at a picture uh, like this one. Um, basically, if you cut these branches in the summer, where there's a lot of sap flowing back and forth, you're going to get some sap coming out because the tree didn't have time to heal itself. And this is a buffet for fungi and for insects that you really don't want knowing that your apple tree is a source of food. So that's why we put on our snow boots and go out in February to prune our trees. So for tools, um, we have some videos that we took um, out in the orchard. Um, over this past winter, if I'd like to share with you. Um, this is me. Obviously, this is a terrible uh, still. I'm about to show off some pruners. And then the other person in the videos are Brandon Carpenter. He's one of our main ag specialists at the Horticulture Research Station. So between Brandon and I, we probably have uh, at least over 25 years of pruning experience, um, which is great. So ironically, I think I have a little bit more than Brandon, but so we're going to talk about the tools. And like I said, I have the volume turned all the way up, but because there was wind, 
um, I messed with the audio, so you might have to turn it up on your end. So here we can see these pruners um, are connect constructed in a way that uh, forms a bypass style blade. So here you can see that the blade actually bypasses through, so it doesn't actually hit into it. These are a pair of hand loppers, and this is an anvil blade. So instead, the blade connects to the top, and here you can see there's a little bit extra power with these smaller hand loppers. So this is, a, this is also a bypass, um, a little longer. So this is nice because you can extend your handles out and have, you know, multiply your leverage on, on the handles. Uh, these Fiskers also have kind of a, a lever. So the, the blade is not connected directly to the handle. There's a lever here that multiplies your force. So for every, you know, for the amount of force you put into the handles, it's actually putting more force on than if it was just pivoting on a single on a single bolt, which is nice. Here's another here's another example, another bypass, but this one is is kind of just the the straight straight to the jaw to the blade, and whatever force you put into it, it's you know it's basically just the law of a, a lever, where it, it is greater force here than it is where you're handling it, but it's it's not multiplying it any for you. So once you figure out what kind of blades you want to use, and uh, my suggestion is if you're going after an older tree that hasn't been uh, pruned for a while, to go, definitely go for ones that have a little bit more power for your punch. So something like this, something like this, or hand loppers. You don't want to use a pair of hand shears on this. Yes, there are some cuts you can make, but if you're uh, renovating an older tree, you definitely want to make sure you have a pair of these. The other piece of equipment that you'll want to have, nope, handsaw, is the handsaw. <laughs> so the other piece of equipment that you'll want to have is a handsaw, which looks like this, latches here. Um, you can Use a chainsaw when renovating these older trees, but I highly suggest that you don't for a number of reasons. Um, one, whenever you cut with a, a chainsaw, that edge is gonna be very uh, jagged and you're gonna have a lot more pathogenic fungi and uh, insects and damage there and that tree is gonna have a harder time to heal itself. So if you can avoid using a chainsaw, it's better. And we'll talk about the, some of the cuts and decisions you can make to avoid using a chainsaw. But. If you feel like you have to, um, I don't recommend it. You should be able to do all of your pruning with the handsaw, loppers, should be able to get you through most of it. All right. Do you want to talk about, well, do you want to talk about the cleaning? We're going to yeah. talk about the cleaning. Is it still rolling? Good. Okay. So the other thing uh, that we have to think about whenever we're uh, maintaining older trees, or any tree in general, whenever we're using these tools, is proper disinfectant of our blades. So you can go out and just pick up some disinfectant wipes. Uh, it doesn't matter what brand. Most of them will work fine. You can also get some rubbing ethanol, rubbing alcohol, and spray them too if you prefer. This is just cheap and easy. So before you do a new tree, Oh, whatever, it's fine. Before you do a new tree, you should always clean down your lopper blades and your saw blades. So you don't have to be super crazy with it. Just make sure there's no pieces of wood, no chunks. There's some bacterial and fungal diseases that you can easily spread from tree to tree or from an infected area to a non-infected area. So definitely do that when you buy your blades after doing that, or if you cut into anything that's suspect, go ahead and do it and uh, sanitize your blades. All right, so um, you can also use 10% uh, bleach to sanitize your blades. Um, I, just, I just don't like using bleach because I always ruin all my clothes whenever I do this. And um, there's been a lot of research, especially for diseases on Apple and um, 
70% rubbing alcohol or um, just using some kind of disinfectant wipe uh, works just as good. So um, there's different ways that you can manage that, but I definitely recommend, uh, this is a mistake I see people make all the time. They cut into a little bit of dead wood or they cut into something that's actually a canker and it doesn't take very much bacteria or fungal uh, product to basically inoculate your tree even worse. So between every tree, definitely sanitize. Um, and then if you cut into something suspicious, sanitize them again. So here we can see these. All right, we don't need to watch it again. Um, so for order of operations, now that we talked about the tools, um, this is typically how I break down cutting up a tree. So here we have a tree here um, that hasn't been uh, pruned for a number of years. Brandon said it was about five or six years since anyone had really pruned it. Um, and these are the order of operations for a tree like this. So we have the three Ds, which I'll talk about in a minute. Then we have suckers from the roots, suckers from the shoots, anything that's overlapping, and then branches going back towards the trunk. So the branches going back towards the trunk are usually a problem on younger trees or uh, trees that are still kind of growing. Typically on the older trees, hopefully those branches have been taken care of before. Uh, but you still may have some of them. So the three Ds, damaged, diseased, and dead. So anything that's been damaged from um, a storm, anything that's been damaged from uh, something hitting into it, a kid playing on it. For instance, this tree, um, oops. Sorry, um, so I think hopefully you can see my pointer. So this tree, actually um, some kids had climbed in it a lot. So there's actually a lot of damage. If you look closely at the trunk, it's really noticeable up here. Hopefully you can see it's kind of like in the right corner of this picture where people have been stepping on it for years. So there's a lot of damage here from climbing trees and try people, mostly horticulture students um, in the past trying to get up into the top of the tree to pick apples. So um, this branch right here, is damaged and it's so it was damaged you can see there was a break here it was also pruned back um, and it has become eventually was diseased and now it's dead so this whole branch here is actually dead and i think yep i zoomed in so this is this branch this picture is a little brighter but uh, you can see here the tree's basically dead up until this point so we have all of these suckers coming out of this branch where it's still alive However, the big part of the limb is dead. So this whole branch here, now that we looked up, would have to come out. And it would be better if we took it off closer to the collar uh, so the tree could heal itself. Even though it's alive maybe six inches up, it's better to cut into the alive wood. That way it has a better chance of healing itself in this case. And in this case, since we're removing a major limb, this would be cause for a chainsaw. But make sure that we go back through and really clean up those cuts. Um, I see a lot of injury coming from chainsaws that weren't properly cut or that they split. So whenever we use a chainsaw, we always start from the bottom and then we meet ourselves part, part way through on the top, right? So just making sure that we're using proper chainsaw etiquette so we don't end up with even more damage. So here we go again, seeing kind of how the tree is still alive about uh, six, this branch is still alive about six inches in. Um, here's some dead branches. So uh, they're pretty discolored. Uh, it's a little hard to see in the winter sometimes, especially for people who haven't pruned as much as I have um, or as much as some people have. So these, um, they're discolored. The barks kind of come off. They kind of have this yellowish tone to them. Sometimes they can appear red depending on the cultivar. Um, but whenever we see dead branches, in this case, this limb is also dead. And you can kind of see how it's losing its bark. It kind of has this weird off color to it. And uh, the best way to tell is just uh, nick it a little bit. So either take like a pocket knife or your pruner and just see if it's green underneath. If it's not green, it's dead. If it's hard to tell, um, it's probably on its way to being dead. So this is a picture. It's a little blurry whenever I have it uh, blown up. Some people think it can look a little bit like dirt or maybe there's just some kind of fungi growing on it. 
This is fire blight. So fire blight is a bacterial disease that apples get that can uh, just kill a little tree. So it'll um, completely kill baby trees, uh, pretty much trees under five or six years old um, can die from it on these larger trees. Like for instance, this tree in the background is over 50 years old that we're taking these pictures from. Uh, fire blight's not necessarily gonna kill it, but if you cut into this and then you cut into um, your next tree without sanitizing, you could spread the infection. So the best thing to do if you see something like this is to cut back at least six to eight inches from the edge of the canker. So here might be a little hard to see, but there's like this weird edge. However, um, this is kind of where the tree thinks the bacteria is, but the bacteria is actually all the way back. Um, and the heavier, the harder the wood, so the older the branch, the less fast, I guess the more slowly, the bacteria moves. So the bacteria moves slowly through older established wood, but uh, six to eight inches. So for instance, um, this is a pruning cut that someone made and this is not enough. So basically what they did here was they got that bacteria all over their um, blades whenever they made this cut, but the fire blight bacteria is still way in this branch. So this is a no-no. Um, this is not a good cut. Uh, this is actually the, one of the worst things you can do when you're pruning a tree. So whenever we're doing our dead, diseased, or dying uh, limbs, we want to make sure that we take them all out completely as far back as we can. And if you have um, a fire blight strike on a branch that's going into the main trunk of the tree, if it's an older tree, you can just cut it back as far as you can. Um, eventually the tree may collapse, but it'll be years. And if it's a younger tree, it can be better. When I say younger, I mean under five years old. Um, you can watch it to see if a canker develops. And if the canker develops, it's actually best to just pull the tree out. So moving on from the 3Ds, let's talk about suckers from the roots. So in this picture, so you can see this is a very nice lar large sized tree. And if you look closely, there's lots of little um, they kind of look like baby apple trees, so but they're not baby apple trees, um, they're suckers. So all apples are grafted unless they're um, a rooted cutting, but a rooted cutting gets like 40 foot tall. Um, and since they're grafted, uh, there's two different um, apple trees connected together. The top part is called the scion, and that's what we eat. So like think Honeycrisp, Golden Delicious, Red Delicious, and then the rootstock is a completely different uh, type of plant, different um, species, sorry, different cultivar. So in this case, um, this is an old uh, seedling rootstock. And um, what it's trying to do is it's trying to put up uh, new shoots. So then eventually what will happen is the, the rootstock doesn't actually want to support the scion. It wants to make its own leaves. It wants to make its own apples. It doesn't want to keep supporting this. So that's one of the other reasons we have to manage the suckers. Um, the suck <clears throat> the rootstocks will actually put more energy into the suckers than they will the main tree if allowed to. So here's a close-up <clears throat> again of this dead branch, but if you look again, we can see all these suckers coming from the ground. And in this case, uh, they're pretty old. So um, it's been a couple of years. So we can actually see on this one, uh, some of these suckers are two or three years old at this point. So they also need to come out. And one of the reasons we take them out right after getting rid of the dead, dying, disease stuff is because it really opens up our view of the tree. They can grow really tall. They can get up to five or six feet tall in one season, depending on um, the rootstock. The next is the suckers from the shoots. So um, some people call these water sprouts. <clears throat> um, and basically what they are, are they're just a vigorous one-year-old growth coming from the top or the scion part of the tree. So here, you can actually see quite a bit of them. Um, typically, they're because uh, pre previous pruning cuts were not deep enough, and there was a couple of buds left that were allowed to grow. Um, these will not necessarily be fruitful for quite a number of years. Also, since they grow straight up, they're more prone to breaking if they get fruit on them when they're older. Now you can use them and bend them or train them to establish a new branch in an area where something broke or like for instance, this tree doesn't have anything in a certain area, so we might train one, uh, bend it down basically to try to get a good angle on it so it does grow correctly. Uh, but most of them are stuff that we have to get rid of. Uh, next is overlapping. 
So this picture um, might be a little hard to see, but if you have two branches that are overlapping with each other, they'll actually bump and rub into each other. Uh, the weight from the apples will also cause the branches to bend um, over time. So if the apples are bending, if the apple branches are bending because there's so much apples on them and you get a lot of wind, they'll cause this breakage and rubbing. And this is a great place for diseases or insects to come in um, and cause problems. It's also hard to see, moist to dark, they absolutely love it. Um, this also can become problematic because we talked about uh, shading as a major issue of why we prune trees. So we wanna make sure that the top branches aren't shading out the bottoms. Um, a lot of times the ideal, a lot of times when we talk about the ideal shape for an apple tree, we actually kind of want them to look like uh, Christmas trees. We want them to have short branches on the top and bigger branches on the bottom. And that's because we want even light distribution unless you only want to pick apples from the top. So the next and last one are branches going back towards the trunk. And again, this is that shading issue that we were just talking about. So this is more problematic on younger trees, but here's my little stick figure. It's a little easier to see this way. We have all of our nice happy branches coming out. And then this one branch was going back towards the leader. And this is the branch that we would remove. So anything that's growing back towards the center of the tree, we want to take out um, if we're growing an older uh, semi-dwarf tree. So whenever we're making cuts, uh, we really want to do a 45 angle cut. Um, this is called a beveled cut. Um, we want to make sure that they're not, it's not too, too high. So my red lines aren't coming across here, but this one and th this, so the first one and the third one are the cuts we're looking for. The second one, um, it's too high. It's too high of a steep angled and there's too much wood here. So basically what we're doing is we are encouraging this bud to grow. Whenever you make an angled cut like that, this bud is gonna open. So if there was a bud here, like right on this area where my mouse is, um, because of the way that the wood is sloped and then the way that the plant hormones work, this one is more likely to um, open. So in this one, there's a little too much wood here. So if there was a bud here, they both might open. This is an ideal cut. And then this one, again, the same problem, it's a little too high. So if you wanted to make a heading cut or a flush cut like that, um, there's a couple of reasons you would wanna make a heading cut or like a flush cut, like a flat cut but you wanna do it a little closer to the buds that you want to open. Um, and whenever you make a flat cut, <clears throat> it's kind of a, um, a betting game, which buds are gonna open and they might not be going the direction you want. So um, I have another video of Brandon doing more pruning. So he's gonna do pretty much everything we just talked about on this older tree, um, except for the suckers. So we already took care of the ground suckers. I spared you that. So let's watch Brandon um, do some pruning on this 50 year old apple tree. And it'll be quiet for a little bit. So right now he's just pruning off um, either the, the water sprouts that were older or the ones that uh, were just growing this year. Now, you'll notice I'm taking the inside here None of these branches are gonna be productive for me. Um, the, the bud, the bud wood or the, the, the branch has to get sunlight. So this branch here, if, if it's shaded, it's not gonna put on any fruit buds or they're not gonna be healthy, strong fruit buds. Um, you know, so anything here in the middle, you can see, you can imagine when this tree has leaves on it, Anything here in the middle is not going to get any sunlight, so it's never going to have apples. But where where that doesn't hold true is out here, where you know this branch may continue to grow. Um, so now that I'm inside here looking at this, I think what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to take most of this off, and I'll leave this one good branch that's grown out that way, and maybe we'll we'll get some uh, we'll get a branch there in a few years. It'll be nice and healthy, but I'm going to take a lot of the other stuff off. And then, 
that that's pretty good for the inside of the tree now I'll work my way around uh, around the outside you can see some of these branches have a lot of water sprouts on them and I'll talk about those when I get in there um, so I'm gonna cut some of these water sprouts out from the branches as I work my way around the, uh, the tree And we're going to come around a couple of times, so I'm not terribly concerned about getting everything perfect the first time out. I can make more, I can make more defined decisions and, and probably better decisions when I get a good idea of how the whole tree looks. And getting the water sprouts out will help me, help me do that. And then this is sped up. He's just making more and more cuts. So Brandon, when you're making those cuts, what kind of cuts are you making? Uh, flush cuts? <laughs> Yeah. So that, we're yeah. Okay. We're uh, making the cuts flush to the base of the tree. We don't want. We really don't want any new wood to come off of that. So these aren't yep. any renewal prunings. This is just getting rid of tissue that's grown. And if you don't flush them out, if you leave a little bit of wood or a bud there, those buds are going to break that were at the bottom, and you're going to get even more suckers there next year. Yeah. And uh, like Brandon said, they can grow up to three or four feet a year. Yeah. And I, I'll. I'll look as I go around, and if I find one that was left a long cut, uh, I'll, I'll point it out. As we get in here, these are going to get easier and easier, the, the cuts, because we'll open up more and more space that we can see. So for water sprouts, that's about it on this first level, actually. I think on this one, you can see there's a, there's a water sprout here. It's a few years old, probably three years old actually by now, but it's attached to this small branch that's kind of taking up a lot of space. So I'm just going to take the whole thing off. And then I've still really only made one cut, but I've eliminated some, some competition here in the middle. Uh, for the other branches. Okay. So now on the ground, as far as the groundwork goes, we're, we're pretty good for water sprouts. I can see some water sprouts still up in the top of the tree, but we'll deal with those as we get up there. And that's, I might deal with this branch here uh, real quick. Here's a good example of, they left a, a little stub here. So you can actually see they had a year's worth of growth here. They cut a branch off and that healed over most of the way. And then the next year they came in and cut another water sprout off, but they cut it past that first one out here a distance. And then another water sprout grew, you know, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to come in here and actually cut that down as flush as I can get it. That's no guarantee that there still won't be a water sprout come out there, but it'll probably be weak. It, it won't amount to much and we'll be able to deal with it next year and we won't get that continuing growth you know where you keep getting stubbed out all right so hopefully that made a little bit of sense um, whenever we're dealing with water sprouts 
Um, so one thing I just wanted to point out was, so Brandon just made that cut and you can see how there's kind of like that dark, like dark spot in the center. Um, so that's necrotic tissue. So uh, because those cuts were made incorrectly, some fungi or some kind of something, some kind of um, pathogenic uh, organism that likes to eat wood got in there and it started causing a little bit of necrosis. So uh, what Brandon should do next is he should uh, disinfect his pruners, even though he's still gonna be working on the, on the same tree, just because we don't wanna spread whatever's in that wound that was caused from that incorrect pruning a couple of years back uh, to go throughout the tree even more. So, oh, wrong order. So this is a, a still of the tree before we started pruning. So um, I, I didn't bore you guys with all the details of every single cut we made. Um, so this is what it looked like at the beginning. We had all of our suckers here. We even had a mulberry bush that had been there for a couple of years coming up. So the first thing we did um, was we went through and got all the dead stuff out that we could. And then it was a little hard, especially for these older trees in this situation, because there's just so many suckers. So we actually went through and um, in this case, we uh, skipped the order of operations a little bit and we took the suckers out first, just because they were so tall. Some of them were five or six feet tall at this point because it had been quite a few years since anyone had managed this tree. So if your tree looks like this, I do recommend maybe doing those uh, rootstock suckers first, just so you can get a clear idea um, of what's a sucker inside the tree, what's actually dead, um, especially if there's like mulberries or other um, plants. So like if you have any wild grapevines or something else growing, um, that would also be something to get out before you start. So the next we went through and looked for cankers. This tree didn't have too many that were um, awful. We took out the ones that we saw. Um, sometimes if we're pruning um, not apple trees, so like plums or cherries or peaches, which is not the topic of the seminar, but uh, we'll see a lot more cankers. Those trees tend to get a little bit more cankers than apples can. Then we went through, um, and you can see here, we uh, have a bare spot around this tree, so we don't have to worry too much about lawnmowers getting close, but some of those branches had a little bit of damage um, from um, lawnmowers, so we took those broken branches off. And uh, this tree only had a little bit of dead, so we took those off as well. Then uh, you just saw Brandon went through methodically and he cleaned up all of the suckers. Um, and then we went through and we started taking out um, some of the wood that was crossing over. So in this still, we can actually see a good one right here on this branch. There's a younger branch coming out here on this limb and we can follow it up. And we can see that there's a bunch of crossing growing on here. So we removed a couple of these branches that were crossing and shading. Um, the best way to do that is looking for the healthiest ones. So even if it's towards the top or towards the bottom, whichever one just looks the best, which one looks the strongest, looking at angles. So um, an angle, a branch that has a crotch angle that's straight up um, is more likely to break. Ones that are at 45 degrees or um, better, will be able to bear the weight of all that fruit um, and they won't snap. So we wanna make sure that we can have a tree that can support the weight of all of its apples without snapping. So looking for those things to help figure out which branch is the best to keep for overlapping branches is important. So, and then we went through and um, cleaned up anything up here that was kind of going in towards the tree that we could. Uh, this tree had a couple of larger limbs going back towards the center, so we couldn't do anything about it. Um, you can see it, this tree was supposed to be um, an open vase. Like I said, this was an older tree, uh, about 50 years old. So back then, um, they trained the trees to be look more like vases. Um, today, uh, the, the strategy or the standard is having a tree with one central leader and all the branches coming off of it, more like a Christmas tree than a vase. Uh, there's pros and cons to both styles. Um, the pro for the vase is you get better fruit quality. The con is it's a lot more labor intensive, a lot more pruning. Um, apple trees prefer to grow with a, a single leader uh, in a single leader way. So this way we're kind of working against its nature. For instance, it kind of just looks like the tree's leaning over. So it shows that branch to be its, um, 
its leader, even though we had tried to train it or they had tried to train it um, as a V. So this is what the tree looked like when we started. And this is a picture of Brandon finishing up his talk and this is what it looked like when we were done. So you can see it's completely different. Um, we've cleaned up everything underneath it and we really took a lot of the branches out. We took um, a lot of wood. So we'll look at it one more time. This is what it looked like at the end. This is what it looked like at the beginning. So one thing to mention too, is it takes a long time to tune back these trees. I recommend prun pruning every year because it can get away from you really fast. Um, we recommend only to take about a third of the tree off at a time. If you take more than a third off, so for instance, if you had to take some major limbs off, it could be a third right away, and that's all you can do that year. Um, if you take more than a third off the tree, more than a third of the wood off, uh, two things can happen. One, the tree becomes so stressed out that it dies. Uh, the second thing that can happen is that um, all of those roots underneath had been preparing to feed every single leaf on the tree above it, right? And if you remove more than a third of the wood, there's so much stored up nutrients under the tree that it really puts a lot of work into using those nutrients. And the best place to do that is, you guessed it, suckers. So if you take off more than a third of the tree, you're gonna end up with a lot more suckers than you did before. So um, for instance, this tree, we're doing it over the course of a couple of years, kind of training it up. Um, and hopefully by 2023, 2024, this tree will be um, back in tip top condition. So we missed four years of pruning. It took us two years to get it back on track. So um, depending on how much or how little, uh, how big or how little your trees are, um, that's how it could be. So one thing that um, I didn't mention that's also a no-no is you should never head an apple tree. So some trees, um, landscape trees might be okay with heading. Uh, I'm not 100% sure on which ones are, but for apple trees, you should never head them. If they're getting too tall, cut them back to a branch that you'd like at an angle, but try to make sure it's like less of a, less, the diameter of that cut is less than four inches. So it might take a couple of years um, to get that tree back to a size you want, especially um, in a case where the tree has decided that um, it no longer wants its rootstock and has made its own roots, which can totally happen. Just like the rootstock can decide that it wants to make its own fruit, its own scion part, the scion can decide that it no longer wants to be on the rootstock and make its own roots. Um, and when that happens, instead of having a 20 foot apple tree, you're gonna end up with a 40 foot apple tree. So um, that's something else to think about with our older trees. So one last time, the start, the finish. So um, this whole process for us, um, we were filming, um, took about uh, two hours. So that's with filming. We also had some students out there uh, who are learning how to do this, also learning how to tape in the wind. Um, so it can take um, a little bit of time to do this. And then in this video, we don't show um, us getting up into the tops of the trees. We do a video on ladder safety that we made this day. Um, basically, if it's really windy, you do not want to be up in the tree on a ladder. It's, it's not worth it. It's not safe. Uh, we do recommend there's tree ladders you can buy. They're three-pronged aluminum ones. They're the best. Um, we're not a huge fan um, of double ladders unless... You're on really stable ground and you're familiar with ladders. Um, a lot of the old timers would use, um, you know, a one-sided ladder. Uh, some of them were so good they could actually walk from tree to tree on their ladders. Um, I also highly recommend uh, not doing that unless you're a pro at using a uh, one-sided ladder. <laughs>